Penguin Random House Audio presents Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno Garcia. Read for you by Frankie Corzo. 1. The parties at the Tuñón's house always ended unquestionably late, and since the hosts enjoyed costume parties in particular, it was not unusual to see chinas poblanas with their folkloric skirts and ribbons in their hair arrive in the company of a harlequin or a cowboy. Their chauffeurs, rather than waiting outside the Tuñón's house in vain, had systematized the nights. They would head off to eat tacos at a street stand, or even visit a maid who worked in one of the nearby homes, a courtship as delicate as a Victorian melodrama. Some of the chauffeurs would cluster together, sharing cigarettes and stories. A couple took naps. After all, they knew full well that no one was going to abandon that party until after 1 a.m. So the couple stepping out of the party at 10 p.m. therefore broke convention. What's worse, the man's driver had left to fetch himself dinner and could not be found. The young man looked distressed, trying to determine how to proceed. He had worn a papier-mâché horse's head, a choice that now came back to haunt him as they'd have to make the journey through the city with this cumbersome prop. Noemi had warned him she wanted to win the costume contest, placing ahead of Laura Quesada and her beau, and thus he'd made an effort that now seemed misplaced, since his companion did not dress as she had said she would. Noemi Taboada had promised she'd rent a jockey outfit, complete with a riding crop. It was supposed to be a clever and slightly scandalous choice, since she'd heard Laura was going to attend as Eve, with a snake wrapped around her neck. In the end, Noemi changed her mind. The jockey costume was ugly and scratched her skin. So instead, she wore a green gown with white applique flowers and didn't bother to tell her date about the switch. What now? Three blocks from here there's a big avenue. We can find a taxi there, she told Ugo. Say, do you have a cigarette? Cigarette? I don't even know where I put my wallet, Ugo replied palming his jacket with one hand. Besides, don't you always carry cigarettes in your purse? I would think you're cheap and can't buy your own if I didn't know any better. It's so much more fun when a gentleman offers a lady a cigarette. I can't even offer you a mint tonight. Do you think I might have left my wallet back at the house? She did not reply. Ugo was having a difficult time carrying the horse's head under his arm. He almost dropped it when they reached the avenue. Noemi raised a slender arm and hailed a taxi. Once they were inside the car, Ugo was able to put the horse's head down on the seat. You could have told me I didn't have to bring this thing after all, he muttered, noticing the smile on the driver's face and assuming he was having fun at his expense. You look adorable when you're irritated, she replied, opening her handbag and finding her cigarettes. Ugo also looked like a younger Pedro Infante which was a great deal of his appeal. As for the rest, personality, social status, and intelligence, Noemi had not paused to think too much about all of that. When she wanted something, she simply wanted it, and lately she had wanted Ugo. Though now that his attention had been procured, she was likely to dismiss him. When they arrived at her house, Ugo reached out to her, grasping her hand. Give me a kiss good night. I've got to run, but you can still have a bit of my lipstick, she replied, taking her cigarette and putting it in his mouth. Ugo leaned out the window and frowned, while Noemi hurried into her home, crossing the inner courtyard and going directly to her father's office. Like the rest of the house, his office was decorated in a modern style, which seemed to echo the newness of the occupant's money. Noemi's father had never been poor, but he had turned a small chemical dye business into a fortune. He knew what he liked, and he wasn't afraid to show it. Bold colors and clean lines. His chairs were upholstered in a vibrant red, and luxuriant plants added splashes of green to every room. The door to the office was open, and Noemi did not bother knocking, breezily walking in, her high heels clacking on the hardwood floor. She brushed one of the orchids in her hair with her fingertips and sat down in the chair in front of her father's desk with a loud sigh, 
tossing her little handbag on the floor. She also knew what she liked, and she did not like being summoned home early. Her father had waved her in. Those high heels of hers were loud, signaling her arrival as surely as any greeting, but had not looked at her as he was too busy examining a document. I cannot believe you telephoned me at the Dunions, she said, tugging at her white gloves. I know you weren't exactly happy that Ugo— This is not about Ugo, her father replied, cutting her short. Noemi frowned. She held one of the gloves in her right hand. It's not? She had asked for permission to attend the party, but she had not specified she'd go with Ugo Duarte, and she knew how her father felt about him. Father was concerned that Ugo might propose marriage and she'd accept. Noemi did not intend to marry Ugo, and had told her parents so, but father did not believe her. Noemi, like any good socialite, shopped at the Palacio de Hierro, painted her lips with Elizabeth Arden lipstick, owned a couple of very fine furs, spoke English with remarkable ease, courtesy of the nuns at the Montserrat, a private school, of course and was expected to devote her time to the twin pursuits of leisure and husband-hunting. Therefore, to her father, any pleasant activity must also involve the acquisition of a spouse. That is, she should never have fun for the sake of having fun, but only as a way to obtain a husband, which would have been fine and well if father had actually liked Ugo. But Ugo was a mere junior architect, and Noemi was expected to aspire higher. No, although we'll have to talk about that later, he said, leaving Noemi confused. She had been slow dancing when a servant had tapped her on the shoulder and asked if she'd take a call from Mr. Taboada in the studio, disrupting her entire evening. She had assumed father had found out she was out with Ugo and meant to rip him from her arms and deliver an admonishment. If that was not his intent, then what was all the fuss about? It's nothing bad, is it? she asked, her tone changing. When she was cross, her voice was higher pitched, more girlish, rather than the modulated tone she had in recent years perfected. I don't know. You can't repeat what I'm about to tell you. Not to your mother, not to your brother, not to any friends. Understood? Her father said, staring at her until Noemi nodded. He leaned back in his chair, pressing his hands together in front of his face and nodded back. A few weeks ago I received a letter from your cousin Catalina. In it she made wild statements about her husband. I wrote to Virgil in an attempt to get to the root of the matter. Virgil wrote to say that Catalina had been behaving in odd and distressing ways, but he believed she was improving. We wrote back and forth, me insisting that if Catalina was indeed as distressed as she seemed to be, it might be best to bring her to Mexico City to speak to a professional. He countered that it was not necessary. Noemi took off her other glove and set it on her lap. We were at an impasse. I did not think he would budge, but tonight I received a telegram. Here, you can read it. Her father grabbed the slip of paper on his desk and handed it to Noemi. It was an invitation for her to visit Catalina. The train didn't run every day through their town, but it did run on Mondays, and a driver would be sent to the station at a certain time to pick her up. I want you to go, Noemi. Virgil says she's been asking for you. Besides, I think this is a matter that may be best handled by a woman. It might turn out that this is nothing but exaggerations and marital trouble. It's not as if your cousin hasn't had a tendency toward the melodramatic. It might be a ploy for attention. In that case, why would Catalina's marital troubles or her melodrama concern us? She asked, though she didn't think it was fair that her father label Catalina as melodramatic. She'd lost both of her parents at a young age. One could expect a certain amount of turmoil after that. Catalina's letter was very odd. She claimed her husband was poisoning her. She wrote that she'd had visions. I am not saying I am a medical expert, but it was enough to get me asking about good psychiatrists around town. Do you have the letter? Yes, here it is. Noemi had a hard time reading the words, much less making sense of the sentences. 
The handwriting seemed unsteady. Sample complete. Ready to continue? Complete. Ready to continue?